uh, and welcome to, uh, uh, to the panel on the future of warfare. Uh, what you're going to hear today is going to draw lessons from actors who employ advanced technologies, but also those who employ, techno uh, employ more established technologies in innovative ways. And doing so, I think, will illuminate not only how the character of war might evolve, uh, but also how war's enduring nature uh, should influence how we develop and employ those new technologies. And finally, we're going to get a glimpse of where some of those more advanced technologies are going to take us. To do that, we've got four distinguished panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Dennis, who serves in Army Future Command Director of Intelligence and Security. Uh, he's been there since February 2019, serving first as Chief of Intelligence Operations and then Chief for Strategic Futures. And he's going to talk to us about the future operating environment and acknowledging that new technologies, as well as new applications of old technologies, may change the way we fight, but there are some enduring features of war fighting that we must not lose sight of to employ those innovations effectively. Then we have Dr. Kathleen Moore, uh, <laughs> who is uh, a graduate of Penn State University with a PhD in Information Sciences and Technology and is a professor of data science at the, here at the Center for Strategic Leadership. And she's going to talk to us about how information operations impact military readiness by providing an overview of the most damaging information operations and then offer recommendations on how to develop a comprehensive information operations strategy as well as train, train and educate the force to employ it. We also have uh, Mr. Lee Grubbs, uh, our, our resident mad scientist here on the panel, uh, who is the director of uh, uh, TRADOC G2 of Analysis and Control Element, as well as the Mad Scientist Program. And he's going to talk about assumptions we should be challenging about our preparation for future warfare and signpost uh, through the prism of recent conflicts in Syria, Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, Russia and Ukraine. And then we have uh, Billy Berry and Fred Gellert, uh, who are uh, <clears throat> going to showcase applications of artificial intelligence, particularly applications to strategic decision making. Uh, Billy is an ethicist and subject matter expert in emerging technologies, serving as a faculty member at the U.S. Army War Colleges, also Center for Strategic Leadership. Probably what I think is most interesting uh, about his bio uh, is that as a philosophy professor, he had an android as a student for a year, and they're going to make a documentary about that, which will be featured at the Sundance Film Festival. That's uh, cool. Uh, and then we have Fred Gellert, uh, who's also a faculty member at the Center for Strategic Leadership, uh, where he works on science and technology management. Last year, he led a student research team assessing the science and technology enterprise. And this year's project, he's assessing biotechnology threats and opportunities for the Army. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. <clears throat> um, as Army Futures Command, Director of Intelligence and Security, um, when we think about the future of land power, the future of warfare, particularly in the 2030 to 2050 time frame, uh, our clear priorities are the pacing threat and the near peer and near peer actors. Um, <clears throat> however, we also look at broader trends, uh, things like technology, things like uh, non-state actors, things like defense trends, things like certain structural trends, right, that affect all of these things demographics, urbanization, climate change, novel and infectious disease. When it comes to warfare, um, warfare in the future will undoubtedly feature new technologies and developments which will increase the speed, the range, the lethality of conflict. And moreover, the democratization of technology means that the U.S. Army must be prepared in the FOE to potentially face and defeat recently developed capabilities and sometimes in unexpected ways. Right? That's something that, want, that we really want to be attentive to. However, anticipating future conflict necessitates analytical discipline and looking beyond novel systems. Now, to be sure, uh, as, as has been noted, there are some essential enduring truths and even some recurrent trends in warfare that suggest the Army needs to be prepared to fight and compete against a range of highly capable and diverse threats, from state to non-state, local to global, professional to private, single adversary to diverse coalition, sometimes in the same conflict and sometimes across domains. Now, in talking about some of these structural trends, when we started at AFC, General Murray had tasked us at providing a, a sort of an update uh, to the TRADOC document, Changing Character of War. Um, and we published this in the fall of 2020. It's AFC PAM 525-2. Uh, it's called the FOE, Forging a Future in an Uncertain World. And to do that, we tried to look at what are the most, what are the most consequential variables, the key uncertainties that will affect the Army as a, uh, in, in the future. And so we looked at the distribution of global power, and we looked at uh, technological optimization. 
And so basically, right, thinking about on a two by two, if you have sort of a high concentration of power, sort of like a bipolar system, uh, at the bottom of the y-axis, you'd have sort of more diffuse uh, power, so thinking about like a multipolar system. And then on the x-axis, you would have sort of high rates of technological optimization and then lower rates. Uh, it's not a true two by two because of, you know, which way does the arrow go, X and Y, uh, but it's a heuristic and it creates four worlds um, that we looked at. And each of those, how do you get to those worlds in the document? And then what do they mean for the future army? And then we also looked at those structural trends and how those might shape future warfare. So again, I alluded to them a, a few a moment ago, urbanization and demographics, global environmental change. Uh, defense trends, non-state actors, novel and infectious disease, and then challenges to governance and legitimacy. So the things that are leading states to sort of right, uh, fall apart, the decay of the state. And again, how do those things shape uh, the types of missions, the types of places that the U.S. Army will be called upon to fight in that 2035 to 2050 time frame? Um, turning sort of to kind of thinking about, and there's been some questions about what can we learn, what can we infer uh, from some conflicts uh, that are going on today, I'd like to talk about three particular things that have sort of uh, kind of risen to the top uh, that are things that we're monitoring. And so the first are, this, are the ideas about game-changing technologies and deployment. Now, clearly, uh, looking at contemporary conflicts around the world, weapons are sh shifting conflict dynamics. But what else? One, the interconnectedness of things, right? So if you just look at Ukraine, the proliferation, the ubiquity of, of things like cell phones and all of the, you know, the sort of the cameras, the surveillance cameras, social media, um, right, clearly have an, an impact on that operational environment. Uh, also things like widespread commercial imagery. And here, thinking about, you know, uh, a couple of months ago now, you know, someone's like, wow, what's this traffic jam in northern Kiev? It's a Russian armored com column. Right? So, you know, we always talk about in the military context thinking about sort of, you know, kind of adversary state sensors or, or things like that, but there's a whole uh, host of commercial imagery and things that are going to complicate the, the battlefield for us. But here's the observed dilemma. Despite all of this ex exquisite technology, despite all of these systems, uh, what we see is that actors are abandoning them in certain circumstances. They're ignoring them or they're repurposing them, particularly under duress, right? So again, it's, it's been alluded to several times here today. Uh, it's not just the technology, right? There's a lot more to it. And so we have to be attentive to that. And even sort of being attentive to under what conditions does that technology actually provide a battlefield advantage? And I, I was actually just reading something last night, uh, just as a quick aside, you know, when the Spanish conquistadors are, are in North America, right, they're a, they're a professional, modern European force with, with armor and pikes and blunderbusses and crossbows and horses and a, and a doctrine to match. It doesn't work here, right? It didn't work, and they had to change. So again, thinking about technology, but what else, right? Um, the second thing is talking about information and disinformation operations. Now, one of the things that we actually saw in Afghanistan for the first time was using I.O. to seize and hold terrain, right? So a novel application of an old technology. Things that we want to pay attention to in the future, of course, are deep fakes at a strategic and a tactical level, uh, things like weaponized in intelligence, things that we see today in the contemporary conflict, um, and then also thinking about what are the opportunities of that. If anyone has read um, the book Small Wars and Big Data, the prolifer proliferation of data analytically has helped us gain an incredible understanding of various conflict dynamics. dynamics. But once again, we have an observed dilemma, which is information overload and, the qual and data quality. And this again, right, back to those sort of enduring truths, uh, another book I was reading recently, Julius Caesar in the campaign in Gaul is complaining about how many uh, reports he's got coming in. There are just too many of them. They're conflicting. You've got you to slow it down, right? So thinking about the cognitive limitations of, of humans within all of this. Now, turning to battlefield dynamics, a lot's been made of sort of the trends in interstate warfare versus intrastate warfare, 52 to 3 ratio. Beyond that, what we see is that foreign military interventions, fait accomplis, subversion, hybrid warfare, proxy warfare are uh, currently the dominant modes. We also see uh, around the world, looking at recent conflicts, the transition from professional soldiers and standly, standing armies to sort of these motley composite groups, right, with PMCs, mercenaries, foreign fighters. Um, and as part of that, conflicts are increasingly multipolar and transnational. And right within these coalitions, you have actors with their own parochial objectives, uh, some of whom are technologically proficient. Another aspect of this is the increase in external support. 
At the turn of the 20th century, one in five conflicts had external support. Right now, it's four in every five. And while in the newspapers they talk about the U.S. once again serving as the arsenal of democracy, hearkening back to the Lend-Lease days, um, other actors do that as well. Right? And as a reminder, you know, 99% of, of air platforms lost in Vietnam were lost to communist or Soviet systems. And so when I think about sort of you know, the lessons or what we can learn from, uh, from Russia and Ukraine, I think, what if the U.S. was put in Russia's shoes? Now, clearly, we would not face sort of dispositionally some of the challenges, insubordination, fratricide, things like that. Um, but situationally, facing some sort of in a future conflict, facing a diverse coalition of, of economic sanctions against us, uh, facing weapon systems that we weren't prepared to face, right? So how many Russians were thinking about javelins uh, a year ago? Um, so thinking about those types of dynamics when it comes to conflict. Another aspect is that warfare is increasingly protracted with inconclusive outcomes, and these are diffusing. The deadliest and most protracted civil wars in recent history, Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen, have all spread violence to surrounding states. Another dimension is that non-state actors are increasingly fighting like conventional forces with state-like capabilities. So here you have the Houthis with A2AD capabilities. But once again, and all of this leads to sort of another observed dilemma, which is that the materially and technologically superior force may not win. Uh, now, clearly, there are ways to have a difference with the right stuff, um, but that sort of is part of, the, part of the challenge, right? Now, turning to uh, some particular observations, um, I know other folks in the panel are going to talk to this, so I, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but thinking about the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War, what was novel in that was that we saw how types of, uh, particular types of uh, external support were critical. And we saw how particular technologies in the form of drones were able to mitigate, uh, were able to mitigate uh, terrain advantage. Uh, I'll skip over uh, Russia and Ukraine because I know Lee's going to talk about that. Uh, another interesting conflict was Libya uh, and thinking about how, right, drones, deniability, disinformation, how on a proxy level, uh, you had not just great powers, but mid-level states. Um, and since I'm down to my one minute, I missed the five-minute mark. I was too focused. Uh, let me just say, once again, right, some truths are worth concluding. Systematic diagnostic review of the theoretical and empirical trends related to warfare requires rigor and discipline. Far too often, the lessons learned conveniently bolster existing or planned efforts. Right? He who forgets the past is condemned to repeat it. He who remembers the past can commit the opposite mistakes. That is the, the risk that we want to ensure doesn't take place. And the same goes for our adversaries. Um, you know, thinking about what they may be looking at. Um, as we modernize our army, as we think about fighting in the future operational environment, what are others doing to mitigate our advantage? Um, that is the question that I will pick back up on Monday when I am in the office. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, <laughs> I debated whether or not to put this up, but um, we, this has been a fairly well-known problem for General Milley for quite some time, so I'm sure he won't mind terribly if uh, I use him in this way. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about digital force protection. Uh, one thing we know, U.S. Army has a retention problem for personnel, and military life is not easy, and in fact, I believe that the Inspector General is embarking on a year-long study of trying to you know, identify key factors of that. But on top of this, we know that the Department of Defense has an IO defense problem. And I'm gonna kinda of quickly go through some things. Um, first and foremost, we really do lack a comprehensive uh, information warfare strategy. Now, I know we have the forthcoming JP304, and uh, in this, we're gonna be talking, it, it mentions defense for the first time, and that's great. I look forward to this coming out and being able to pick it apart. But having just come back from the Phoenix Challenge, which we hadn't had in 12 years, this was just two weeks ago, where we were looking at the state of information warfare, information advantage, and uh, um, IO operations, everything was externally focused and everything was on the attack. And any time anybody asked a question of defense, Crickets wasn't discussed in the least. I'm hoping that the next one in the series uh, will accomplish that. The problem that I'm seeing, and I'm a person who is immersed in data 24 seven, and my preferred environment is semantic online environments. So I see people and messy information and you know, the social scope of it all the time. And the one thing that I've seen is that you know, our Department of Defense really needs to move beyond limited def definitions of informational attacks where we really only talk about mis and disinformation 
in the gray zone, and we have to kind of understand what's the totality, what's the full scope. And when we really get our head around this incredibly immense, dynamic, fluid, complicated problem, we can start planning for a defense. You know, do a news search. And, you know, going back probably up until about 2014, with shocking regularity, we keep seeing that we have a problem and it's being directed at our military. Online romance scams, our veterans being targeted by not just foreign adversaries, but also by domestic violent extremists. Um, you know, uh, Russian apps, you know, being pushed towards um, active military. Um, fake news reports about real soldiers in real places, but the news being absolutely false. And also, of course, you know, bring in social media and the massive proliferation of imposter accounts. Uh, this one really kind of blew up last December, and I took the opportunity to start going through the GOMO list and seeing what I could find and just looking at Facebook before they banned me from searching. That's a sensitive topic. <laughs> I have found a shocking amount of accounts that people weren't aware even existed. And let me be clear, this is not due to a lack of cyber hygiene on anyone's account. This is people just, we live in a free and open society with a free and open internet. We have freedom of speech here, and that means that people are just sucking this information out of the environment and creating these accounts. Some of them are benign. Some of them I can actually see being a little beneficial to us. And then the other ones are very, very problematic. I've also seen subtle doxing of our senior military leaders around the world. Um, I could fill this slide with headlines that I found, and these are all coming from different countries, and very sensitive information that I am not entirely sure our general officers are aware or even out there, and this is a problem. When we get down to you know, the reality, reality of it, when we talk about defense, unfortunately, we keep thinking misdisinformation, some big lie, right? And we really don't need that because when we think about information-based attacks, they can be subtle, they can be on the domestic home front, uh, and they're very, very low tech and they're very cheap. I was just on dark web last night looking at a uh, hundred component botnet just for DDoS attacks, depending on the price of Bitcoin, goes anywhere from like five to 10 bucks. But if you wanna look at a hundred component botnet of pretty decently constructed fake social media accounts, that will only cost you maybe about $75, $100. And you know, a 100 component DDoS attack, that's not very powerful. We know how to thwart that. But a 100 fairly well constructed fake media accounts pushing out a lie and where we know for fact that the first lie wins, that can be very devastating. And that's something we need to be aware of. And of course, this isn't a shock to anyone. The attack surface now beyond, you know, expands beyond the soldier, now going to their family. I constantly hear when I talk cybersecurity with people that I have nothing to hide. I'm like, okay, you might not, but can you say for sure that your partner doesn't? Can you say for sure that your children don't? Can you say for sure that your extended family doesn't? You know, that's not something that we think about. We think about it you know, on the individual level, and we have to start thinking about it in a communal level. So if an adversarial goal of information operations is to change behavior, you know, we can see how misinformation, really targeted misinformation, could sow division in units. And that's not hard to do. We've seen it on a societal level, but think about it, it was really targeted at specific units. We think about malinformation, which is real information, but can be, you know, catastrophic to someone's reputation that can be used and weaponized. Uh, we can, we've already seen how real accounts can provoke kinetic action. There's some really good impersonation accounts out there that I have no doubt could do the same thing. We look at the attacks on family, potentially you know, taking leadership, making them take their eye off the ball. Uh, I think our general officers have more important things to do, but family security is important as well. And we can't deny the psychological effects that these really targeted attacks have on the individual. People report like having that lens on them really shatters their sense of personal security. And that has a lasting effect. And we can also look at, um, as uh, General Robertson was talking about, you know, security cooperation, which I think is a very powerful tool of the, particularly the US Army. If we looked at strategically seated reputation attacks, that could poison that environment where we seek to have security cooperation. And when I see this kind of low-level doxing in the context that that's occurring, 
again, we can see that these are, these are real problems that we need to face. At the end, what could this do? This could provoke a soldier to reconsider a military career. You know, what's the cost to benefit? You know, if I have a family, is that cost just simply too high for my career aspirations? Possibly. So what we need to do is we've got to start getting to the left of boom. Um, if this looks familiar, this is similar to a MITRE attack cybersecurity TTP chart. And this was, I borrowed this from the Cognitive Security Collaborative, and then I added a lot more to it because they, you know, they, they were missing some stuff. But if we can get to the left of boom, when we start looking at information attacks the way that we start mapping and try to understand the TTPs behind technical attacks, there's quite a bit that we can do with this. You know, we can get into effects-based countermeasures. Now, can we stop everything? Absolutely not. That's impossible. It's a big, messy world, a lot of moving parts, a lot of porous borders, if you will. But there's quite a bit that we could do. And with really, really strong defense, if we start even just doing the minimum, I think we can get to a point where we start to get into detour, where we can discourage certain behaviors because our adversaries are seeing like it's simply not going to work. So how do we get there? We have to start thinking about shrinking and hardening our attack surface. So one, comprehensive IW strategy that includes defense. Start thinking beyond just the simplistic nature of mis and disinformation. Again, I know JP04 is coming out. I look forward, or JP304, excuse me. I look forward to digging into that. We need to realign relationships with social uh, media companies. Now, I'm going to pick on Facebook, I, one, because they banned me and I'm still bitter about that. <laughs> but also, they are the big bad. They have proven themselves to be wholly untrustworthy and utterly complicit with our foreign adversaries. They have had done absolutely nothing to check this proliferation of not just mis- and disinformation, but also the rise of all these imposter accounts. But yet, they are still the preferred communication platform for a lot of the Army, and we have to start rethinking our relationship with them. I know the Army understands cognitive security and cybersecurity at an enterprise level, but we treat it like an individual problem, and that has got to stop. We also have to do comprehensive training and tools for all ranks. Now, this is kind of my Christmas wish list. You know, civilian, not in the Army, so take all of this with a grain of salt. But we have to stop getting out of compliance training and into security behavior training, which is infinitely more, more effective. I could see the Army providing a cybersecurity li um, license and uh, information removal services for every single soldier for the duration that they're in the Army. I could absolutely see that. And we need to expand digital force protection across our general officers. I know that Army Protective Services does that for select few, but there's absolutely no reason where we cannot expand it across the entire general office, officer corps and eventually work our way down. Good morning, my name is Lee Grubbs and I lead the uh, Mad Scientist program, uh, but also uh, lead the analytical effort across uh, TRADOT from an intelligence perspective. But the work I'm gonna talk about today really represents a team that's come together over the last two months from TRADOC, <coughs> AFC, Forcecom, U.S. Army Europe and others. And I'm gonna walk through a little bit, of some, a few of the ideas that are, uh, that are bubbling up but also encourage you, if you're interested in being part of this group that we're developing that's focused on uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the future of war, that you send me a note and you will immediately be part of it. A few cautions. Uh, we heard John Ahern talk about these. Uh, one that I like to say is there are no facts about the future. So that, that's a key thing. Uh, what we can do is that we can challenge our assumptions and we can look for signposts of what the future might look like. Uh, but we also have to know that this conflict is just one aspect, one example of large-scale combat operations. So I just give you those cautions, uh, but there's still probably a lot to learn here. Next slide. Just a, a couple of things to start off with uh, when we talk about assumptions and challenging them. Let's look at a couple of the assumptions Russia made. First of all, Russia decided that their unit of action would be a battalion tactical group. Uh, they ran into a major problem with that because they did not practice multi-echelon aspects, support that would come from outside battalion tactical group. We've decided that our unit of action is a division, 
And I would challenge you to think about where are we actually training multi-echelon aspects from battalion, brigade, division, and corps. Now, I know we're developing the STE and their plans like this, but the real question is, can we build the expertise we need in our Army, multi-echelon, or do we face the problem, same problem that Russia had in the future? Uh, another key aspect is Russia considered that their army was modernized and their leaders are ready for this fight. All of their leader experience was places like Syria. Every general officer that was fighting in Ukraine had Syrian experience, had been rotated through there. That very limited experience did not translate to large-scale combat operations. We are making a huge assumption about the leaders in our army because our experience is Iraq and Afghanistan. So we ought to be asking ourselves, what do we need to do for leader development, professional military education, training experiences to ensure that we don't face the same aspect of this where our leaders get into a fight where they have not been prepared for it because the Russian leadership clearly was not. Another aspect of this is the Russian learning and what they learned. So it's always interesting to see what your adversaries learned so the Russians learned from Nagorno-Karabakh is they had not armed enough UAVs. Their UAVs were integrated with artillery battalions. They were basically spotter observers for, artil for artillery units. They recognized they needed to arm them. They were late to the show, and they've not really performed well. Their armed UAVs have not performed well at all in Ukraine. So sometimes a first mover advantage does work out. The Ukrainians who bought TB2s and have some innovation they've done internal to Ukraine have had successes with their drones. So there's, there's some key assumptions to think about and also what we learn from conflict. And if we learn the wrong thing, it can lead to uh, failures in the future. Next slide. So there's a lot of work we've done on this. And later, if you contact me, I, I can plug you into our running estimates we're doing. If you're on JWIX, I can get you to the classified side. But we also started three excursions, which I think are very interesting, specific to this panel. The first ones, we're building a deck of signposts. These are things that we see in Ukraine that tell us potentially aspects of the future of warfare and conflict. Next slide. So the first one, the digital levy on mass. This is something we've been talking about uh, in the, just in the mad scientist program for several years. It never really stuck, but now you see a, a real live iteration of this. And this effectively really impacts the Army. We're developing our information advantage doctrine, and we ought to be thinking about what the information fight looks like. And it is not the U.S. against China or the U.S. against Russia. It is, it is anybody who's fighting in the information domain is fighting a large group, a digital levy on mass, people from across the world, and it affects us significantly. I'll give you one example. Uh, the Ukraine IT Army developed a capability to take pictures of dead Russians with their, with their personal information and send it to the moms of the soldiers who are fighting in Russia. Okay, they were doing this in a matter of hours. What is our casualty notification process? This will happen to us. This breaks down trust. When you send soldiers into a fight, the trust is if something happens to us, our families are notified in a respectful manner. We do that, it's, it's hours and hours and hours. This is the fight we're gonna be facing and it's not against just a country. It's against an ideological and economically focused army around the interest of an adversary. And this affects in competition, crisis, and conflict. The digital levy on mass is something we, we, we need to uh, address as we think about the future of the information domain. Next slide. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We heard General Ahern talk about this, but here's some very specific facts. The Russians have had over 31 command posts destroyed. And there's a lot of reasons why this, and we get into it offside, but this, you know, our command post today are, are just too large. There's too much being done for it on the battlefield. We will not fare any better than the Russians did with our command post. And this is something that Forcecom's already waiting for. This isn't a 2030 or 2040 thing. If we go to war in two years against a near peer competitor, our command post will not fare any better. Uh, also, you know, this goes all the way down to the individual. You know, a great example would be the war comms development work that Ukraine's done where they've taken uh, video cameras done from drones, fixed video cameras, use some basic facial recognition software where they've been able to identify individual soldiers, and I could flip that on its, on its head and do what Kathleen was just talking about and weaponize it 
and create fake events. There's nowhere to hide on this battlefield. So, you know, protection, masking, whatever you want to call it, is, is a major issue we have to address. Next slide. So another excursion we're doing is ripples. You know, what are the, what are the second and third order effects of Russia and Ukraine? Next slide. And then we have, we have whole decks of these things, and we're working on visualizing, but here's a couple of examples. Of the near abroad, the Russia has moved military forces out of the near abroad into Ukraine to fight. It's creating a power vacuum, and also some of these areas are taking high number of casualties in Ukraine. It gets into where birth rates were high, where people were recruited, and potential uh, flares of conflict in the future in the near abroad uh, with, uh, with Russia. Next slide. And another one, people are moving. There are four major people movements going on because of this conflict. One of them we know about, the refugee displacement out of Ukraine. Uh, Russian intelligentsia is leaving Russia. I had 250,000 here. There was a report recently that it was over a million. These are the, these are the future, this is the future of the IT part of the Russian, uh, of the country of Russia. So it's a major issue for them. Uh, hunger. Uh, we're going to see a major uh, new migration out of South Asia, South Asia and North Africa into Europe. It's going to create some real friction in our European partners and their governments, and then foreign fighters coming and going, fighting for the Russians and the Ukrainians. These four people movements are going to create ripples globally that might affect the U.S. Army in the future. Next slide. So our third excursion we're doing is what China might be learning. And I go back and tell you that we saw Russia learn some things incorrectly in the conflicts they were looking at, and it affected them. This could happen to China as well, but we're just watching what China might be learning. And just a couple of high points, um, we produce something every week on this. So if you want to get connected to this, I can connect you with this. But a couple of high points, they're noticing that they don't have enough precision munitions to stockpile. Uh, that's a problem we have as well. Uh, they've noticed how effective Ukrainian drones have been. They're going to go back and look at their counter UAS capabilities. They also have a pretty decently effective drone system as well, but they're going to uh, work on it. They know that Taiwan has watched this. They've seen Taiwan notice the effectiveness of Stingers, the effectiveness of ATGMs, the, the real threat in the littoral area. Small boats are under significant threat in these areas. So uh, Chinese are watching every bit of this, and they're learning. If you want to follow on that, how China fights uh, landing zone we have, it's a link that's on the slide. You can Google it. You can find out how we've laid out the Chinese ATP, unclassified description of Chinese tactics, and you can get to China learning, and you can learn more about what China might be learning about the future of warfare. Next slide. So I just say that a key thing is there are no facts about the future. Really, this is about challenge your assumptions, look for the signpost, and see what it means about our modernization effort. And this isn't a wait till 2030 issue. Some of these things are doctrine, leader development, and training. A few years ago, I was teaching a philosophy course in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the school I worked at was primarily students that were first generation, over 80% acceptance rate. And we had the opportunity to debate West Point yearlings in an honors class about lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. My students knew nothing about lethal, not non-lethal weapons yet. Um, knew nothing about ethical systems, laws of armed conflict. How could we possibly compete? Well, that year we were experimenting with augmenting the classroom with AI machine teaming with the teacher and the students. We had a humanoid, now robot, which could remember everything. So we downloaded all Army doctrine into, his name is Frisco. Frisco is awesome. It's kind of like a, a sad copy of Dr. Bonin, but not as good as Dr. <laughs> Bonin. Over here, we have MariaBot. Now, MariaBot at the time was a mind clone, or a, it's called a mind clone, but it was a mindware of a wife of one of the richest CEOs in America. Martin Rothblatt helped with Alexander Haig and our satellite system. She created Sirius Radio. She created the first artificial lung. She created the first all-electric helicopter. Right now, she's working on the first designs for an all-electric airplane. So what a mind file is real quick is you take all the memories, characteristics, and skills of someone. You don't upload their consciousness. That's Silicon Valley sci-fi. And then you put it into whatever you want it to be, a machine, a box. And here we do it in an Android. Why is it in an Android form? Just very quickly. One, if we look at space exploration, especially in India, they have one of these sitting in the cockpit. So we need to think about, do you really want to be in space stuck with that in front of you? Now, 
she's pretty cool. If you see the Indian version, you'd be horrified. The arms are like really, really long and it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> Two, she's in the form of a woman because we're trying to get more young ladies involved in robotics. There's overwhelmingly men in this field. So that's why she's in this, uh, she looks the way that she does. You'll see the avatar we're gonna bring up. It's also a woman, but we're working on it. Long story short, we look at West Point. Philosophically, we think like football. They're like a wishbone offense, right? We're West Coast. So we said, they're gonna ground and pound us. So how do you beat West Point? Well, we'll use our machines to keep West Point at what they wanna do, which is ground and pound. So, doctrine here, future non-lethal over here, because the lady happened to be a pacifist. What West Point did is fell exactly in our trap. They got stuck in the past. They talked about doctrine, going back to old wars. The debate was about the future. So the one thing that our students were very good at it was with strategic thinkers. They're first gen students. They navigated their way for the first people in their family to make it to college and be successful. So while these West Point students were far brighter as far as raw intelligence, having better access to better coaches, like it was just me, they had three or four people much brighter than me supporting them. But what we had was a way to seize the initiative, right? To exploit the initiative. So every time they brought up doctrine, there was Frisco just going right back at them. Every time they wanted to talk about lethal, non-lethal, they enjoyed. And then we would make an argument going forward. The result, we crushed that honors class. And then the second team we tied, which we took as a victory as well. So what we learned is, and this came, we had a researcher in the room that's doing a doctorate at Maria Rochelle, is that the characteristics of education are fundamentally changing in a room where you have AI, human interaction occurring. And furthermore, the students talked about they saw their future in social life and work changing because of AI. And beating West Point on the academic battlefield, Fred and I started talking about, will mindware, this idea of uploading the characteristics, change the character of war? When I can take, and we're gonna talk about that, some of our best fighters and upload their characteristic strategies into a device, be it an automatic weapon, be it into an autonomous weapon, anything like that, how does that change warfare? When we go into war games, instead of it's blue piece versus red piece, I can actually put in actual people, thinking of World War II, Rommel is actually there. Big difference if Rommel's coming after you in the desert, rather than, hey, it's a new recruit out of Germany coming to you with the tank. So war gaming would change drastically because you're talking about the actual soldier. Are we doing that now? Yes. But we're doing mostly physical things. What's your rank on shooting? All these kind of physical characteristics. We want to bring the cognitive into the war gaming thing. It will save lives and it allows us to simulate. So in our debate, we simulated, simulated, simulated and used machine teaming. What we're going to introduce today, was just born in the last three days, is a digital avatar that looks to the future and will answer any questions that you have. She's a military advisor. She read a thousand books on war theory over the last 24 hours. So she'll talk about the Arctic. She'll talk about anything you want. I've tested it on a few folks here, and she's doing pretty good. But the idea is to visualize what AI can do in the future. She's gonna make mistakes today, but visualize how this can be effective in your job as a senior leader and how it's gonna change warfare. And if you don't like it, because it's a little creepy, Right? I, think, I think this is a little creepy. I'm a Catholic guy. I had to go to a priest and say, Am I, is this all right? He's like, I'm not really sure if it's all right, but we'll, we'll watch it, you know? What happens if we d decide that we're not going to do this technology and the enemy does? The Pentagon's spending a lot of money on electromagnetics, cyber, but when it comes to AI strategists, there's very little money being spent, if at all. And why is that? Why is that? Because I can tell you that our, our adversaries will be using AI strategists, and that makes a big difference. And I'll turn it over to Fred, my colleague, and my mentor. Fred? Okay, so I've already got the five minute hook, so I'm gonna speed through this and then we're gonna get to this demo. Um, so strategic decision making, highly complex environment, we talk a lot about that here at the War College. What's missing in some of this AI things that we're seeing and machine learning coming out is that automation being able to think like a human. In particular, that experienced leader and ultimately think like the commander. And that's the vision of this mindware as being applied to the military is how do we get those experiences, that background, that those thought process put into the machine. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Billy. He's going to ask the system a few questions, and then we'll talk a little bit about some opportunities and challenges going forward. Yes. Okay, there we go. So this real quick, this is um, the, uh, to be totally, I have it, uh, and behind it, we'll see if this works. The noise up here has been a little bit, Tough, so let's see if she can understand me. If not, I might have to type in the questions. I can hear you.
best strategy for Ukraine to beat Russia? That is interesting. Tell me more. Best strategy for Ukraine to beat Russia? Well, Dr. Barry, since you're asking for my opinion, I think the best strategy would be to focus on winning the hearts and minds of the people in the Donbass region. If the people there see that you're on their side and fighting for their interests, they'll be much more likely to support you and help you win. There is no easy answer to that question. The situation in the Donbass region is complex and ever-changing, so there is no one-size-fits-all strategy for beating the Russian army there. However, some general strategies that could be effective include, building up Ukraine's military capabilities in the region, so that they are better equipped to fight against the Russian army working with allies to put pressure on Russia diplomatically and through economic sanctions providing support to the Ukrainian government and civil society to help them better govern the region and meet the needs of the people that thank you for asking, Dr. Barry. I hope this information is helpful. If you were a Russian commander, what is your strategy? Well, if I were a Russian commander, I would likely use a variety of strategies in order to gain control of the Ukrainian army and Donbass region of Ukraine. I would likely use a combination of military force, political manipulation, and economic pressure in order to achieve my goals. I would work to disrupt Ukrainian supply lines and communications, and make it difficult for them to move reinforcements into the area. I would also launch attacks on key Ukrainian military positions and try to capture as much territory as possible. Additionally, I would try to exploit any divisions within the Ukrainian government or military in order to further my own objectives. What Taiwan strategy beats China? You and your Taiwan strategy beats China. What Taiwan strategy beats China? I'll type that in. We'll just do a lot more. You and your Taiwan strategy beats China. I can hear you. Uh, that's some problem. Let's do one more question, and then you guys will be able to answer anything you want. Speech recognition is disabled. Click in the red light to turn on. I can hear you. Uh, I asked a question. What? Um, oh. Sorry about that, guys. We'll put it in here. All right. How about if I go ahead? You can talk on. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna move forward. So, pretty impressive. Really, when you think about that was just a few nights of digesting documents and that sort of stuff. And those answers are not bad, right? Obviously, it's not a war college student that's about ready to graduate from the war college level, but it's a pretty good answer for a system that just digested. Um, all right. Um, Entering sleep mode. Some of the Say wake up to start recognition. I can hear you. She's, good. She's, she's temperamental. All right, let me just, a couple opportunities I can see for this. C2 systems that provide and anal analyze situation awareness, friendly force predictions, enemy force predictions, automated control that is both timely and accurate for the specific operational situation you find yourself. Weapon, weapon system autonomous controls that think like our best leaders and soldiers and make the right choice for the mission. A thinking robot missile gun that understands the mission, not just how to get to the target. Intelligent automated communications between systems and humans that offer decision making at unprecedented speed and quality. For war games and simulations, a thinking enemy that replicates the most probable adversary leader, not just a group of Americans pretending to be that leader. But there are certainly challenges. Data and decision security, replicability and transparency, you hear about those kinds of things with AI. This just takes it to a new level because you're effectively trying to train this thing to think like people. Data management and access, competitor use, influence and hacking of data, mine files and systems. What happens if they get in there and start tricking this thing? It's tough to figure that out. Removal of bad, old and incorrect data from the large data sets and how to change the lessons that the system's picking up from that bad data. Poor ethical decisions. We spend careers in the military developing leaders that can make sound ethical decisions. How does that work for this system? And the last one, I'll just remind everybody is these advanced computing systems are electrical power hogs and hence why Billy was at this end of the table because he had to plug this thing in and so fortunately I moved down here. All right, 
Um, so those are just some things to think about. But this is clearly, this is today's technology, and you can see where it's at, and you can only think of it as moving forward from here. I'm going to let Billy close that out, and then we'll open up for questions. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I didn't let her talk. Have a successful day. Thank you, Maria. Um, what you see real quickly is that if you look up here, you see there's an identity. And if you see the identity, it says it's, she's a military advisor called Maria. That's how she's adapting. If I put it, she's an evolutionary biologist, she puts it through evolutionary biology. So it's whatever you put up there. She knows every word in the English language, and she's using about 10 different engines. So it's not just GPT-3. It's lots of natural language processing. What's fascinating about this is that all this information is coming off things that are available to all of us. So imagine if she was just on a classified system, and you were asking for information. So lastly, what we're doing is this. I'll end with this quote. If we continue to develop our technology without wisdom or prudence, our servant may become our executioner. And that was General Omar Bradley in the 1940s. We plan on bringing General Omar Bradley back to life next year for this conference, working with AHEC, having his strategic thinking be able to participate in things like JLAS. So we'll have historians as our bellwether, if it's true, and then we'll test it out. And that's, again, Chris Wheaton, myself, Fred, and uh, Dr. Moore. So we're very excited about that opportunity. And I apologize for going over the technology went over a little bit. Thank you, sir.